today we are not going to do more magic we're going to know how to secure secrets in the GitOps area okay uh, my name is um, my name is Alex Soto okay well here you've got my Twitter and some books you'll get more information about this and first of all a definition what is a secret at the end I just going to the Cambridge dictionary and said a piece of information that is only known by one person or a few people and should not be told to others because today we're going to talk about secrets but not you know not our login and password to uh, enter to our Gmail Facebook and so on I'm just talking about secrets that we as a developers or as an operations or a DevOps we are using to access to for example our database or to our um, email service or any other service right or any other third-party service like an API key so we're going to talk about these secrets okay just keep in mind that secret is not something that we can um, let's say just apply one technique we need to apply a lot of techniques we you'll get it a really protected or you're really protecting secrets if you add a lot of layers so you're just like okay I'm going to encrypt the secrets then I'm going to put this layer of security then this another layer of security and so on because at the end any attacker might try to get your secrets that's the reason of an attacker right so if you put a lot of layers maybe they will break one layer but you will get another layer securing your secret so again we're talking about DevOps GitOps let me just introduce you a bit of yes you know two minutes of what is the DevOps what is GitOps DevOps basically it's a methodology and that's really important it's not a tool it's a methodology okay M that will make you if you apply it correctly um, make your lead times shorter it means that you'll get or you'll be able to go to production more faster more um, often than you've used to do Keep in mind that, as I said, um, DevOps is a methodology, not a tool. And, impl and this implies that the whole organization, the ops teams, the PMO, the, uh, the security team, the developers, the QA, the DBA. I'm not saying that the DBA are zombies. I'm saying that DBAs loves working that. Okay. So all of them needs to be embracing this new methodology and what is GitOps? okay well GitOps, it's again we can say that it's like an implementation of DevOps or a way to implement uh, DevOps that has these three uh, main pillars the first one is that the git is the a single source of truth it means that everything is in git not only your application code not only the source code of your application but also you know nowadays sadly all the YAML files to deploy your application to probably Kubernetes so all this infrastructure um, code all this code that helps you deploying your application building your application must be in git repository then uh, again you need to treat everything as code all your infrastructure needs to be as code and this implies that maybe you can have different branches of your infrastructure maybe you've got the main branch which represents the uh, state of the production environment but maybe you've got pre-production branch which is the state of the pre-production environment maybe you've got the staging branch okay you get it right so you you, you have all these things that git git give us to build this infrastructure and how you update this infrastructure well okay sending pull requests we've been doing this for long long years in 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 Git, right? When you you have your application code, you want to do a change, you do a pull request, someone reviews, and then you merge it. In this case, with GitOps, you're doing exactly the same. When you want to update your database version, you send the pull request that will be reviewed, and when it's merged, then your new database version or your upgrade will go to pro to production or to pre-production or to staging or to any of these branches. So, what is the GitOps application deliver delivery model. First of all, at the at here at the top, oops, it's quite here in the top. Okay, you've got the source Git repository. So it's your application code. Basically, in your application code, you will just make a change. You've got the pipeline where you will build application. You know, create the container, run tests, and so on. And finally, you will create a container image that will go to the image registry. 
But then you've got a second Git repository, this infrastructure repository, this config Git repository, which is here in the in the bottom here. Okay, that basically are all these manifests that helps you uh, maintaining the infrastructure or helps you to deploying your application to um, to the uh, servers. And now you see that you've got the CD part, so the continuous delivery part, and finally we've got Kubernetes. What is the key point in Git? It's not on, on GitOps. It's not that you only have this Git repository, but you've got a process here, okay, here, that basically it's monitoring this change. So he's monitoring the change of the config Git repository, and when it detects that someone has merged something to a specific branch, then it will detect this change, take the action, and deploy it. So basically, if you've got in your config Git repository a deployment YAML file, and you change it, for example, changing the tag of the container image, there will be a process, in this case it's Argo CD, but there is other tools up there. But in this case, Argo CD will detect this change and will apply updating the deployment in the Kubernetes. So, let me show you this in a quick demo before we get into the, um, into the, um, in the, into, into the secrets, okay? Now, here, I've got um, my, my application, my, well, uh, source code, I think that you can see it, yeah. So I've got just one YAML file. In this YAML file, basically, what I'm doing is configuring the Argo CD. I'm just saying, Argo CD, just go to this repo URL, this GitHub, Red, Red Hat Developers, Demo, OpenShift, GitHub, examples, or whatever, in this path, in this uh, branch, and uh, start monitoring what is in this, in this, um, in this repository, okay? This is what I'm doing here. Just configuring Argo CD to monitor changes on this uh, repo and apply them to the uh, Kubernetes cluster. So I'm just going to do kubectl apply minus f uh, to do app. I apply it. And then here, I've got the Argo CD. Um, you see here, this is the Argo CD, oops. Network, okay, yeah, sometimes happens. Okay, now, you can see that this is the Argo CD dashboard that it's applying some YAML files. Basically, it's de um, deploying my application. You, well, you, I don't know if you see everything, but you can see that there is some PostgreSQL there with a PostgreSQL secret. You know, it's just to, you know, configure the PostgreSQL with the username and password so my application, my to-do application, can access to this um, uh, database. Yeah, you see that it's uh, deploying everything. And finally, eventually, the application will be deployed. Uh, well, this is uh, my Kubernetes. If I go here, one second. And not all projects, but the to-do project, you can see that I've got like two pods, one with the Postgres, one with the application. And if I click it here and I go to uh, slash, oops, to.html. Okay, you see that the application is deployed, okay? I've just applied one specific YAML file and then Argo CD will monitor this repo and um, deploy the application. And any change that I do in this uh, repository, in these YAML files, for example, changing the container tag, I will get automatically deployed to uh, my production servers. Now, of course, I could even uh, go here and uh, application, I can delete the application. I put here to do app and done. Now my application has been removed automatically. Probably some of you will say, okay, nothing new. I already know this. If not, okay, you learn something that is like, you know, this um, GitOps thing. But this, has, this is the repository, okay? You see that I've got uh, some kind of YAML files for Postgres, other YAML files for my application, you see here that there is a secret, and we said, oh, this is the username and password to access to, you know, the secret, I'm going to inject it into my application to access the PostgreSQL database. And let's see what is inside. Oh, you see that? Okay, it's a Kubernetes secret. In data, you've got username and password, and you can see here this thing. It seems not secure at all, right? Yeah, you almost said, oh, yes, it's just a random, uh, letters here, I know, but eh, what's happened with this? Well, basically, 
that this is not an encryption um, data. It's encoded data. It means that you can do echo minus n, you put this, b64 minus minus the code, and you will get admin. So you will get the real value. So, surprise, Kubernetes secrets are named secrets, but they are not secret at all, because they are in base64. Oh, sounds familiar, this card? No? Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be, right? That was your card. Because, well, the problem with secrets is that they are not secret at all. I mean, that there is no 100% system secured. So I'm just going to show you some techniques that you can use, but just keep in mind that it's not true 100% secret uh, um, process so you can just try to as I said adding layers and layers and layers but you can always be exposed to someone stole your secrets so how we can start protecting these secrets okay I'm going to show you two uh, projects the first one is sealed secrets Sealed secrets is a project that you install in uh, Kubernetes okay it installs as a Kubernetes controller and lets you, instead of dealing with Kubernetes secrets, dealing with a new object, which is named sealed secret, that, finally, it's a secret that is encrypted and not encoded. So, basically, it works in this way. You've got your Kubernetes secrets. You still create, you know, your YAML file in a Kubernetes secret YAML file, so it's, you know, here, not, it's encoded, not encrypted, and then you're going to run with one tool that is named kubeseal. So basically with kubeseal, when you run kubeseal encrypts the secret, it's going to take this secret locally, it's going to connect to the controller, to the seal secret Kubernetes controller, and it will say, hey, give me the public key to encrypt this secret. And then it will return the public key, and with the YAML file and the key, it will create a new object that, as you can see there, here, you see that it says, um, encrypted oops, encrypted data and it's just a chunk of letters so now your secret your YAML file is encrypted it's not encoded at this point you can remove the Kubernetes secret from your la uh, from your laptop from wherever you um, apply this process and you can always work with this object now finally you can push it to git because it's encrypted and not encoded. So anyone who has access to your Git repository will not have access to your secrets. Then, of course, Argo CD, which is there, it will detect this change and it will say, oh, look, there is a new uh, object, which is a sealed object. It will apply it, but in the process of applying this sealed secret, what's going to happen is that Kubernetes controller will detect that there is an there is an object named seal secret of kind seal secret and we'll say oh look i've got a seal secret and everything is here encoded but kubernetes only understands kubernetes secrets not seal secrets so what i'm going to do is just get my private key use it to create a kubernetes secret object and then store it to atcd as you can see sorry as you can see here so now the process of storing a secret inside git it's protected so you've got a object a secret that is encrypted you store it in git then you push it to git anyone who has access to this object will see just a chunk of bytes but when you apply this sealed secret object into kubernetes kubernetes automatically will decrypt and apply this Kubernetes secret into the ATCD. The ATCD, I don't know if you know what it is, but it's the database where a lot of information of Kubernetes is stored, um, and one of those objects is the Kubernetes secret. That's one of the projects that you can uh, use, and it works pretty well. The second one is external secrets. This is another project. Again, it's a Kubernetes controller, but in this case, it works in a different way. Basically, what it's doing now, these external secrets, is, um, 
What's happen if I don't I do not want to store Kubernetes secrets YAML files into my GitHub repo? Because I'm using a sec a secret manager. So I'm not just using any more uh, you know the Kubernetes secrets object. I just want to store my secrets into a secret manager. And it could be HashiCorp Vault or it could be any of these major cloud providers like Azure Key Value thing or Azure uh, Vault or the Amazon or you know or the GCP. It doesn't matter. Okay? So you want to store your secrets there and you want to consume them from uh, from uh, the Kubernetes. Then you can do the next thing. The first one is of course creating the secret into this secret management the tool. In this case, I'm just using Vault, HashiCorp Vault. You say Vault, KV, put, secret, PSQ, uh, PSQ, username, admin, password, admin, whatever you want. You run it this, and then you'll get your secret into any of these secret management tooling. Of course, then you need to uh, consume it. And to consume it, you need to create YAML files. And of course, you still want to have these secrets protected. Then, how you do this? OK, the first thing is creating a YAML file that is named secret store. This secret store is a element from the external um, secrets project or controller that configures the connection to the uh, secret store. So basically here, as you can see, I'm saying, look, you need to connect to uh, vault 8200. So this is the URL. And uh, the secrets are in a slash secret, as you can see here that the secrets are in the slash secret. So just put in this. So just configure this connection. So this, with this object, you're configuring this connection. And then what you need to do is say, OK, this is the connection. Now I'm going to configure you, uh, which is the secret, the secret that I want to inject into the Kubernetes cluster. And you see that it's a, a bigger uh, YAML file that you said, OK, this is external secret. And I've said refresh interval 15 seconds. It means that every 15 seconds, we'll get the secret from the uh, secret management to check if there is an update or not. And then you say, look, uh, please just take the secret from uh, this uh, the secret store that we've created uh, previously and create a new Kubernetes secret object that is named PostgreSQL secret. And the key username should be the property uh, PSQL username. So basically here you can see, you know, all the arrows where you say uh, I'm just configuring that the target PostgreSQL secret is the name of the Kubernetes secret and you see that the secret key is the key that you're putting in the data of the Kubernetes secret and the property of the remote ref and the, with the key and the property is where you want to get the secret. Okay, so basically what you're doing with external secret project is getting the secret from your secret management tool and automatically creating a Kubernetes secret object and apply it. Okay, so you see that now your secret is not in the Git repository anymore. It's in the secret management tool. And then with just these YAMLs, you are consuming them automatically and creating a Kubernetes secret. So let me show you these two tools. Um, in action, so you can see how they work. Um, mm -hmm. Let's uh, start, for example, with uh, seal secrets. QNS. Uh, wait, I don't remember the name. Is seal it example. Seal it example. Oops. OK, now uh, I can go. Um, you can see that I've got a PostgreSQL secret. This secret is in my local machine, and it's a Kubernetes secret. It's not in Git yet. Now, what I'm going to uh, do is um, encrypt this YAML file so I can push it to Git. And I'm going to use kubeseal. So you can do kubeseal uh, minus minus format YAML, because this is a YAML file. The Input is Postgres secret, and the output is sealed Postgres SQL secret dot YAML. So now when I run this, kubeseal is connecting to my Kubernetes cluster, 
asking for the public key to encrypt my secret, encrypt the secret. Now, if I do an ls, you see that I've got another file here that is named seal postgres equal secret that it does not contain the uh, secrets encoded, but uh, encrypted. Now I could, if I, I if uh, I wanted, I could um, remove this postgres secret.yml file. I don't do not need it anymore because now my secret is encrypted, so I can remove it. So no one can st uh, stall it, and this can be pushed to uh, um, to your Git repo. Now when I do kif curl apply minus f of the sealed postgres sql secret remember that it's encrypted i can apply it and if i do qf carol get secrets you'll see that there is a new secret five seconds ago this is a kubernetes secret created and it's my qf carol uh, get secret oeml Come on. Network. Well, sometimes. Okay. Well. Network, yeah. Wait. Wait, I can. Let's go. Oh, and there is no. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, let's see the other one. No. Okay. Well, sometimes if you do this and you do that. Going here, oops, connect. Okay, let's see now. Let's refuse it. Hi, let me check. Maybe if I do. No. Mm. What is the here? Not other networks. Jetnet. This one? Jetnet. And the password? Jetnet. Jetnet. Oh, thanks. Oh, you've got. Oh. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, you can put it right here. <laughs> oh, wait. Well, yeah, put it. No, it doesn't matter. Put it just. Thank you. There is nothing like having, you know, work makes that are prepared for the new wall. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you. Well, you. I think that now. Uh, what's happening now? Here. Cube admin. And the password is. Dum -dum -dum. Yeah, yeah, I know. But it's, you know, that's the, the, the great thing that I, after the session, I will destroy the cluster. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean that. So, so sometimes I think that my, my work is more than, it's like creating and destroying clusters than <laughs> doing other thing. Okay, let's see now. Yeah, thank you for the cable. Now it works. And if I do the same thing as before, maybe if I, I just still here. Yes. You can see that this is just a Kubernetes secret with the encoded version. So I've got it a uh, encrypted version in my l uh, in my laptop. I apply it and then seal secret automatically decrypted and apply it this secret into the cluster. Now it's just a normal 
uh, secret. The good thing is that if I want to delete this secret, what I need to delete is the seal secret. If I delete this seal secret, automatically uh, the seal secret controller will say, oh, you deleted the seal secret that I know that is linked to the secret. So I'm just deleting as well. And the same happens if you, for example, are rotating the secret. It's going to update that secret. So there is a direct relationship between the seal secret and the secret created by the controller. Now, let's go to the other example. The other example is um, using um, external secrets project, which oops, to here. Let me change the, um, the namespace. Mm. Here you can see that I've got Vault uh, installed. So I've got uh, Vault here running. And I'm going to go to the pod. Okay, I'm getting into the pod. And if I do Vault key B get secret slash foo, you see that there is a secret here. Okay, there's a secret with the key my value and the value secret. Okay, so this is inside Vault. So inside HashiCorp Vault, I've got my secret store. And you can see that I can revoke, I can renew, and so on. Now, I want to have this secret that is inside Vault inside my Kubernetes cluster as a Kubernetes secret. So I'm going to do kubectl apply. Oops, not in this directory. Um, external secrets. kubectl apply minus f. Cluster secret store. Cube. secret store. Here, as I said before, basically I'm configuring the connection between the external secret project to the HashiCorp vault. So now, you know, I'm just creating this connection. Uh, now, the other thing that I need to apply here is the external secret, which is which is the secret that I want to create from the HashiCorp vault into the Kubernetes cluster. And the secret that I want to uh, get is that secret slash foo, where the property is my value. Okay, this is coming from here. You see that this uh, secret, uh, secret slash foo, and the key is my value. And I want to put it inside a Kubernetes secret that it's, I want to rename it example sync. So now when I apply this, If I do kubectl get secrets, you see that here there is this example sync secret that was not here before that contains, again, kubectl get secret minus all EML. This secret will contain this property uh, here, foobar, with the value that we set in the vault. Okay, so. This is another project that lets you manage your secrets in the GitOps world because now you are not putting any kind of secret inside the Git, but inside a secret management tool. And then uh, with these YAML files, you will get all the synchronization. And now, let's go in here again. And Okay, we've seen one part of the keeping the secret secret, right? That it's storing in Git in a good way. But ATCD is not encrypted. And this is something that you might be scared because you could say, oh, I've got a Kubernetes secret that it's named secret, but it's encoded, so it's not very secret. And the ATCD, this is where we store the secret, is not encrypted. So Okay, it seems that there is a lot of surface for an attacker to get our secrets. So, this was also noticed by uh, the Kubernetes uh, uh, the, um, engineers and said, oh, yes, it's true, it is, it is not encrypted, but we're, 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 go we're going to create a new object, name it encryption configuration. But basically, it will be like a layer between our Kubernetes secret and the ATCD. So every time that you apply a Kubernetes secret, the content of that secret is going to be encrypted and stored into ATCD. And probably you will say, well, that's all that I needed, right? Well, actually not, because you, you can see that the secret 
and the keys to encrypt and decrypt the secrets are in the same machine. So if an attacker get access to that node, it will get the private key, it will get the secrets, and will decrypt it. Of course, it's harder than before, but and it's not the best practice. So one of the solutions that I encourage you to uh, use is, first of all, you can move ATCD outside Kubernetes. That's supported, you can do it. And now, if your Kubernetes node is compromised, your ATC, um, your, you know, um, your um, secrets are uh, compromised, or the keys are compromised, okay, that's fine, because the keys are still in the Kubernetes node, but your data, your secrets are in another node. So two nodes need to be compromised be uh, before an attacker can get the secrets. Another option is using the key MS. KMS is something that they added after that, that basically it's the same, but you're using a KMS system, a key management system, like for example, HashiCorp, HashiCorp Vault to uh, manage that keys. So basically what you're doing is sending a Kubernetes secret content to an external service, which will encrypt the content, get it back and store it to ATCD, which is running inside Kubernetes. Now, if an attacker wants to get the uh, the content needs to compromise your ATCD node and also going to uh, HashiCorp Vault and get the private key. So it needs to compromise again two systems, which is harder. Oh, but yeah, I know that you might say, oh, that's the solution, but there is even more. Because how you inject the secrets into your application? Well, maybe you inject them as an environment variable Right, because it's like, yeah, I create a secret, I can inject it as an environment variable. I've been doing this uh, all the time. Yeah, that's fine, but you know that it seems not secure at all, right? Putting secrets in an, as an environment variable. Basically, because it's super easy to get it. You just get access to the node and you do export and you see them. Or maybe you've got some kind of lock system that uh, it's printing the environment variables. So you're printing the secret. So, okay, there is another option, and you might say, yeah, but I usually inject them as volumes, right? Because at the end, as volumes, I'm just creating an in-memory um, file system, and I'm putting there the secrets. You can do it as well, that's true. The problem is that they are really easy to get it as well. You just need to do fstab, you'll get all, all the mounted file systems, and then you say, oh, look, this, mount, uh, this uh, mounted file system seems that they are storing some kind of secrets. You can just go there, do a cat of that file, and you will get the secret. So, yeah, okay, it's not the best way, right? Third option could be using Kubernetes API. So your application is just querying directly ATCD. So if you're querying directly ATCD, means that the secret goes from the ATCD using HTTPS into the memory of your application. So there is no MEM variables, there is no files running in your system which is fine, but you'll see that you'll get a lot of things to do, like, you know, uh, um, giving uh, giving permissions to access the secrets, uh, creating cluster roles. Well, you can do it, but yeah, it's hard. So I would say that the, op the best for me, the best option that you might have here is using a secret management directly into your application. So in this case, it's HashiCorp Vault, but it could be any other one. Basically, I'm putting HashiCorp Vault here because I've got, you know, full example with this. And what you're doing is installing HashiCorp Vault in one node. You store all your secrets in that, in, you know, in this HashiCorp Vault. HashiCorp Vault, uh, since it's a secret ma uh, management system, knows exactly how to store these secrets, how to protect these secrets correctly. Then from your other node, your application will just authorize to get secrets from this secret management tool and get them. So you can see that in a, let's say in an easy way, you're getting secrets and injecting them in the memory space of your application. So harder for an attacker to get them. It's easier if it's an environment variable, it's easier if you're, is they are in a file, but it's hard if they are in the memory space. What is the problem with this approach? Because yeah, there is some problems. Well, first of all, is that there is a new tool to operate. 
Okay, so we are talking about a secret management tool. That's fine, for example, HashiCorp Vault, but you need to know how to deploy it to Kubernetes, how to operate it, and so on. Um, another problem is that requires code changes. So the, at the end, your application needs to interact with this tool. So for example, this is an example of, of how you can do it with Java, with Quarkus, you only do uh, well, you, you do inject of ball KB secret engine, and then you can just uh, start doing get, 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 and injecting them into your application. The good thing is that, first of all, you're injecting your secrets in the memory uh, space, so super protected. Second thing is that these tools, for example, HashiCorp Vault, provides a lot of ways to keep your secrets secret, safe. For example, they have some kind of auditing and monitoring tools to detect attacks. Um, also, it helps you a lot on the secret rotation. So you can say, oh, I want to rotate my secret every 15 minutes. And HashiCorp Vault will let you do this. So you, and every 15 minutes, you will get a new secret. Or, for example, key rotations. If you want to rotate your keys, for encrypting the secrets, you can also configure it. So it's a tool that you need to operate, but it's really, really powerful. So let's win down. Uh, as I said, there is no good or bad. I mean that sometimes I, uh, I explain this to uh, some of our customers and they, and they tell me, yes, but we've been injecting the secrets as MBO behavior for 20 years and we never had any problem. So we're going to continue to do it in that way. And that's fine if it works for you. That's fine. I'm just explaining you some problems they might find and how to fix them. Keep in mind that the attack can come from any place. It can come from someone externally, but maybe they attack you, for example, in the pipeline of building the project or from the logs. Maybe you're putting all your logs somewhere and you put in the secrets and MBO variable, the MBO variable are printed in logs, logs are sent it in a log system uh, or uh, in a log system yeah like for example uh, a log stash okay and then someone attacks that system and they get it the secret from there or for example from the backups because at the end you want to create backups of you know of, of your git repo for just in case or recovery or uh, your logs you want to have it them back up somewhere for the future um, you know uh, checking or for regulation purposes and maybe they attack the backup system or maybe from the legacy uh, um, application. So one of the great points here uh, that I, I also encourage you to do is do secret and key rotation. So every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, rotate the secrets. Because maybe an attacker will be able to get the secret, but probably it will be outdated when he tried to use it. So try to rotate as, um, as often as possible your secrets. Um, also, I recommend you using Istio. I don't know if you know what is Istio. Again, it's a service mesh. It helps you a lot on protecting the communications between services. So if you do not know exactly what is Istio, just let me tell you that most of our customers are not using Istio because yeah, it, l it let us know, uh, do some kind of um, mm, high level routing systems or because they are uh, helping us implementing resiliency patterns. No, it's not for this. They just using because they or Istio let them secure correctly the communications between applications. Also use tools like Falco, Stackrox, Snyk. It will help you a lot on detecting, you know, bugs that can or um, or mm, data or leaks that can go uh, into the libraries that you're using and how you could implement it. Then, what it's important here, I would like to say, is that no secret is the best secret. And you will say, what? Yeah, it's true, but I need secrets, right? HashiCorp, HashiCorp Vault has one thing that it's named dynamic secrets. Basically, is that HashiCorp Vault manages the secrets. So, for example, you say, this is my PostgreSQL database, but I do not define any username, any password to access. And I've got my application that has no username or password to access to this PostgreSQL database. And it's going to be HashiCorp Vault who's going to inject the username and password to the PostgreSQL database and to my application. And 
you will, you're going to configure that every two minutes the password you want to be changed so you as an operator are not managing the secrets you as a developer are not managing the secrets it's just HashiCorp Wolf who are doing and it's rotating automatically so if there is no secret if you know no secret then you are let's say more secure because there is no secret to store and uh, as I said there is no magic solution probably you will need a secret management tool but you will still need some kind of Kubernetes secrets because to access the secret manager from Kubernetes you will need a Kubernetes secret to access it right so it's not like I, I want to use this or I want to use that but probably you need to do both them working together just if you want to um, learn a bit more of it there I've wrote these two books one is securing Kubernetes secrets the other one is GitOps cookbook okay in both in both uh, well in both we are talking about security in the second one we are more talking about um, uh, uh, GitOps this is the QR code to download GitOps cookbook for free okay so you, you, you just can go there you will go to developers.redhat.com you register and you will be able to download the GitOps cookbook uh, for free and finally this is uh, some links that you might find uh, uh, well, you might need for example the first one is this slide the second one is the examples that I show you today uh, well this is the GitOps cookbook the end of depa slash learn if you want to learn more about uh, Istio and things like that you can go there and finally if you want to uh, try this in Kubernetes in a cloud Kubernetes um, yeah, um, implementation you can use the Dev developer sandbox which basically is a free uh, OpenShift um, cluster that you can run with just like I think that it's two CPUs and 14 gigabytes of memory and it's free and you can use it and that's all uh, thank you very much and enjoy the conference